According to the records of the Ohio Grand Lodge of Masons, Neil Armstrong's father is a Freemason. In fact, Neil Armstrong Sr. is a high-ranking 33rd degree Freemason. Neil Armstrong's co-pilot, the second man to have allegedly walked on the moon, was Buzz Aldrin. At the time of the Apollo 11 mission, Buzz Aldrin was a 32 degree Freemason. They were in good company, as many of NASA's astronauts were also Freemasons, including Gordon Cooper, Walter Shearer, John Glenn, Edgar Mitchell, Thomas Stafford, and Paul Weitz. These men were all members of the Brotherhood, all sworn to keep secrets on pain of death. These astronaut Masons were under the leadership of Kenneth Klangnecht, who was NASA's Apollo space program manager. According to an article and photograph published in the Masonic magazine Scottish Rite Journal, Buzz Aldrin presented a flag to Sovereign Grand Commander Smith, who was the Supreme Commander of the Supreme Council of 33rd Degree Masons of the World. The flag Buzz Aldrin presented had been taken on Apollo 11. Like Christopher Columbus and many explorers before them, Armstrong and Aldrin used a flag to claim territory for their monarch. Upon their return, NASA space program manager Kenneth Kleinecht invited the Apollo crew to a secret Masonic ceremony, which saw Kleinecht's brother be appointed to the sovereign grand commander and titular head of all Scottish Rite Masons throughout the world. Once you learn the occult significance of words such as Apollo, Columbia and Atlantis, you will realize that the occultically inspired murdering Nazis who developed NASA's space program have used names which are part of ritual, magic and the occult. NASA spent gigantic sums of money during the 1960s, but most of it was spent on the ground, not in space. Huge American corporations, many of which were manufacturing hardware for the military, made gigantic profits designing space vehicles and more importantly, life-sized models of spaceships and even huge stage sets resembling the lunar surface. Someone in NASA had realized that after taking billions of dollars from the American people, if they couldn't make it to the moon, they would fake it to the moon. Obviously, if you're going to somewhere that nobody has been before, you need to have a simulator which recreates that environment as closely as you can. If you're going to the moon, you recreate the surface of the moon. And here we see a section of the lunar surface created. It's about 30 foot high, 30 foot long, 35 foot long. The scale is given by the two people standing in front of it. There were plenty of simulation exercises, but the point is, and this is, should be taken into account in virtually everything that is discussed with the Apollo program, 400,000 people may have worked on the program in total, but none of them had a need to know more than his own job required. 
the people who were making the rockets didn't know what the people who were making the spacesuits were doing because they had no need to know about that. Their job was to make the best models and the best uh, simulation of the lunar surface that they could. And if we come up to this picture here, we see the three scales on which these models were built. We have here the whole moon as one unit. It stands about 20 foot high. We have here behind it a section of the surface of the moon. You'll notice it's curved. And here we have a more detailed section of the lunar surface. What you're saying is that the images which we're told show a camera pointing out the window of the lunar module as it's coming into land on the moon could well have been filmed previously using these large-scale models. That's right. It could well be that what we are looking at are films of realistic models. We have no means of knowing if they were actually taken on the lunar surface or whether what we're watching is part of the simulation exercise and the training exercise. And you'll notice here on these models there is a camera track. A camera starting at this end, coming down here, would approach the moon or appear to approach the moon and become ever closer towards it. It's exactly what you would expect to see if you were flying to the moon. This is a simulation rig that was built. Uh, this is the command and service module of the Apollo program. And you'll notice that the window here looks out onto a block here. And there's another one here. They're curved. These are the screens onto which the lunar surface was projected as the craft made a simulated approach towards the lunar surface. Is what we're seeing a mixture of fact and fiction. It is fact. It is fiction. It's mixed together. It's hard to separate them until you examine it closely. If a spacecraft is in deep space, the only possible explanation for a light seen through the window of the spacecraft is the sun. It's the only bright light in space. If it's not the sun, then it has to be some other artificial light which implies that that particular image is possibly fiction. July 1961. NASA was soon being criticized for the flimsy construction of their hardware. The first orbital capsules did not even have windows in them for the astronauts to look out of. Could the footage which we see of the limb approaching the moon be filmed in a TV studio? It was filmed in a TV studio. There's absolutely no doubts whatsoever about that. And the way that this film was created was by the use of models. There's nothing secret about the models. They exist. You can go and see them today. The models were very lifelike, very realistic. There is one that is a life-size model. It's in Flagstaff in Arizona. It's two miles long and it's an exact replica of the Sea of Tranquility. The photographs were used to create from those images the replica of the Sea of Tranquility so that if it was flown over in a helicopter it would appear as if it was a spacecraft approaching a similar area to land. So yes, all the scenes of the lunar surface were filmed on Earth. On the 25th anniversary of the event in 1994, Neil Armstrong made a rare public appearance and held back tears as he spoke these brief cryptic remarks before the next generation of taxpayers as they toured the White House. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to 
those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. He is with very layer. near and hot studio lighting that left one hot astronaut inside. Assuming that it was the astronauts inside, after all, their faces were always covered. The necessary mammoth amounts of air conditioning were probably responsible for the air current. Here the editor cuts to a still shot of the flag, just as the effect becomes noticeable. Here it is unchecked. This rare clip, attained decades ago, was never re-released with the inevitable increase in experience and scrutiny. To demonstrate one-sixth gravity, a bouncy, floaty feel to the astronaut's movements would be similarly achieved with relative simplicity. Slow motion. You are viewing the scenes as they aired more than 30 years ago. Now let's look at them with the speed doubled. It becomes discernible that they are, in fact, in Earth's gravity and are no more leaving the ground than they would on Earth. It is clear from these rarely seen color television pictures that the crew of Apollo 11 high resolution color video camera with them on their mission. Yet the only pictures broadcast live from the moon's surface were these from a low definition black and white camera. In fact, the networks complained because in addition to this, they were forced to shoot the images second generation off of a projection TV of the technology of 30 years ago and were not even allowed to take a direct feed which further degraded the quality and clarity of the images. Perhaps this was precisely what NASA and the federal government had in mind. After all, it was a first, regardless of where they were. Better to open up their debut mission with fuzzy pictures and numerous blackouts rather than show too much revealing detail of a false scene that was yet unproven. And finally, the element that seals their fate. All the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period. One gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11 Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity of the actual spacecraft, necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks so great. Over. Over. Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. 
Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Uh, Roger, Neil, we just wanted a narrative such that we can, when we get to playback, we can sort of correlate what we're so much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from any other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out, or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11, calling in from about 137 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. Finally, the iris is opened up to see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July, and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July, and then the 20th, 
and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier, and the moon is some three days' journey away? Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon, why would they be faking any part of it? Why this trickery with the window? By faking being halfway to the moon, it becomes apparent that they did so because they could not even go halfway. It thus confirms that the stumbling block to their success was the lethal radiation of the Van Allen radiation belts. Since the same equipment was used on the subsequent missions in the 40 months that followed, none of them could have gone to the moon. They only increased their proficiency at staging them. When some TV viewers of the second manned mission to the moon telephoned the networks complaining that reruns of I Love Lucy were being interrupted, it became clear that for the taxpayers, once was enough. But it wasn't enough for the government and contractors. Billions of dollars of pure profit went with each return. How coincidental that the following mission would have the element of life and death jeopardy. Apollo 13. Now the public would take going to the moon more seriously and be reconnected with the drama. We now realize that perhaps the reason Neil Armstrong has never given an on-camera interview is because he doesn't want to lie anymore. What threats may have been made upon such honorable men or their families to possess their reluctant cooperation and later ill feelings towards perpetuating this hour in American history? NASA's highest-ranking official, James Webb, resigned without explanation just days before the first Apollo mission. Why, when he was on the threshold of achieving the greatest accomplishment of his career? All three Apollo 11 astronauts also resigned shortly after their return. On the 25th anniversary of the event, in 1994, Neil Armstrong made a rare public appearance and held back tears as he spoke these brief cryptic remarks before the next generation of taxpayers as they toured the White House. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you we say we have only completed a beginning. We leave you that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of it. Saying I misrepresented get it myself. Away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. You want me to knock you in the head? Well, I want you to I want you to swear get to God on the Bible me. that you walked on the moon. Okay. If you walked on the moon, we're given the opportunity to swear to God that you walked on the moon. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get the hell knocked out of you if you don't leave me alone. So why don't you just put the into the record in the argument and put your hand on the Bible, swear to God you walked on the moon. Mr. Cyril, yeah. knowing you, that's probably a fake Bible. Well, you're talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you talk to the administrator in NASA? We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. Of course. I don't hit people, but you're going to be on the deck unless you get well, the I'm heading out. I appreciate it. Get the hell out of the okay. Well, I've hate your stuff and get the fuck out. Why don't you quote me and say it's bullshit? I'm in the shadows in a wrong place. I don't give a, I don't give a damn about all that shit. Shit. Of lunar orbit being falsified. Being falsified? Correct. We've got an unedited tape from a source at That's the Johnson Space Center. Yes. Totally nonsense.
Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Okay? I mean, do you have Neil Armstrong interviewed already? No, he, he doesn't want to be interviewed. Well, I, I know. Why does he, why does he not give interviews? <clears throat> well, because that's his personal uh, choice. And I guess it's mine, in a way, to do things uh, when they've been uh, researched and worked out as far as a business arrangement. This is not news. This is not an anniversary. Well, actually, it is. We found uh, a very unique reel of footage that we have queued up to show you. Yeah. And it's from the mission. And to our knowledge, no one has ever seen it before. Mm. And it's 30 years old. And, and you want me to see this while you have me on camera? Well, and to, and to tell us what it is. <laughs> I mean, it, it's... Uh, well, I don't know why I should do that. It's a, it, well, it's a very it, unique I, Well, footage. it may be that I need to see it, and then we sit down and we talk about what you're taking a picture of. I don't see where there's an advantage in it for me to do what you're asking me to do. I see all sorts of pitfalls. I see <clears throat> people who have managed to talk to somebody. Who did you talk to in our office? I talked with uh, Heather at Tor Books. Yeah, but is this helping book promotion? Are you going to be putting anything out during the time that I'm marketing books? So Heather is not, does not represent me for the things you're talking about. She represents <coughs> um, a, a book selling activity. I think when you see the footage, you'll you'll see that it's what? very extraordinary, one okay. of a kind, okay. behind the scenes yeah. type of footage. Yeah. Well, if it is, why do you have access to something that no one else has seen before? Serendipity, I guess. And uh, it was recorded on the 18th of what? Of July, 1969. Do you remember this? In the 18th? No. Not me. Call Apollo 11. Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks so great. Over.
discussing the what, what is your uh, proposition? That we didn't go to the moon? I know for a fact that you did. Huh? I know for a fact that you did not. You know for a fact that we did not. That's correct. If you'll see this paper. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not interested in, in satisfying your suppositions when there's all this evidence that we did. This proves, as you see, that you were using the window to demonstrate that you were halfway to the moon when you were Turn the camera off, please. Turn the camera off. Oh, shit. It shows that you're in Earth orbit. Now, if the moon is three days away, and this is late on the 18th, how could you possibly walk on the moon two days later when this was shot on the 18th? And you want me to sit in front of a camera while you're taking pictures, you're showing this, and then you want to see my reaction? I know for a fact that's that slimy journalism. Do you realize that? If, if you ought to be ashamed of yourself. If you read the document that I have in here, you'll find that it's not. But this is a personal plea to do this right. Well, we sit and we talk about things ahead of time. The document that you want to see. I know for a fact. But what it is you're trying to do is unethical. You don't believe that? No, I do not. Well, then, then we have a difference of opinion. This is where you're using the window of the spacecraft to appear to be the Earth far away. Yeah. We got the raw footage of it. We have an auxiliary track, so I'm prompting you when to speak. You believe in UFOs? No, you believe we've been visited by Well, why do you no, want to believe this? I know, for, I know for a fact. We've had this analyzed. And, and this, this is the window. And you're in, and it's dated by an atomic clock at the Goldstone tracking station, which is on the tape. Well, you're that talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you there? talk to the administrator in NASA? We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. We're I, know not for, I know for a fact that it didn't And this tape would prove it in a court of law. It would. It would. try it. Why don't you put your money into a court of law and see how people laugh at you? You want it? No, no one has laughed. camera working? No, no, no one has laughed. And, and this makes you the, the real famous person who has discovered this and reveals all this stuff. What an ego you must have to want to propel yourself like this. That's not why I'm doing it. And God knows that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for the truth to come out because I think it was wrong. You can also notice how the astronauts. No, but you're doing it the wrong way. You don't mislead somebody like me to come in here. If you didn't go to the moon, that's misleading people. I'm, t I'm showing you okay, this tape. Okay, we went to the moon. We're not misleading anybody. Then, then how is it possible this that is this, this is the window that it's shot to make it look like Look, you can manufacture all you want with this these This is straight. This isn't manufactured. Sure. You know that it isn't. So that's of an interior of the astronauts at work. I believe this would prove it in a court of law that you did not go to the moon. It's dated on the 18th. It proves when you remove the credit. Give me your business the card. It's all in there. It's all in there. This proves that it's the window. You can see them removing the crescent insert that you did to create the terminator line in front of the window. You're so full of shit, I can't believe it. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Okay? What was the temperature like in the spacecraft on the moon? Well, the lunar module uh, that was uh, the vehicle that we landed on the moon, it, it was uh, just like this room we're sitting in here right now. We had a thermostat and uh, it worked a little different than the air conditioning in a house or a building. However, it had the same effect. So uh, if it was too hot, we moved it up a little cooler and so we could get just the right temperature we wanted. Now, when we put on our spacesuits and close them up, then we had a backpack on, and in that back was a, um, essentially an air conditioner too, a different kind, a kind that would work in a vacuum, and then we could keep uh, our suits the right temperature, because human beings, even though we've got a lot of good capabilities, you know, our brains are amazing, our eyes are amazing, we don't perform well if we're not within a really narrow temperature band. If we get too hot, we sweat, we don't do well. If we get too cold, we shiver and we don't do well. So it's important for human beings to have temperature control. And of course we do that on Earth real well. If the LEM didn't have climate control would it, and had air in it, would it be hot or cold without the climate control? If you just took a, a lunar module and, the, well let's take the climate control and it fails. All right, what happens then, you've got air in sitting there, it's, uh, it's uh, 70 degrees. 
If the lunar module is setting in the sun, which it always is, then slowly but surely that temperature inside is going to go up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, you ain't going to make it because you're going to cook long before that. What you're powered the air conditioning? Uh, what powered the air? Batteries. You had a, a number of big batteries in the lunar module. They powered pumps. They powered the air conditioning. They powered the communication system. And that's the reason we were only able to stay on the moon 33 hours. Later on, we got a little better batteries, more batteries, and we could stay longer. But batteries turned out to be, for the weight involved, the thing that gave you the power. Now, this, uh, the best. Now, the command module, which had to last from the moon and back 10, 12 days, then batteries would have been too heavy. And so we used fuel cells there, which took hydrogen and oxygen and put them together and made electricity. So it depends on, like in a car, you wouldn't want a fuel cell now because you, a battery can do the job. But if you were trying to replace the engine, maybe you could use some fuel cells to drive the motors. Be too expensive now, but maybe someday. What was the power of the engine that descended to the moon? The rocket engine? Yeah. The rocket engine that we used to descend to the moon was uh, a very simple rocket engine. Uh, it operated at low pressure so that it was like running your car at 30 miles an hour, not running your car like a race car. The, the engines we used to launch from Earth was like running your car at race car speeds, you know. So everything had to be just right. But we were interested in safety paramount right there. We didn't have last minute checks we could do. We only had one engine that couldn't fail, so it ran at lower pressure. And uh, w when you were in it, you couldn't hear it in the vacuum of space. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No. Now, I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. Beginning at an altitude of 1,000 miles and extending an additional 25,000 miles lay lethal bands of radiation called the Van Allen radiation belts. Every space mission in history with humans on board, from both the United States and Soviet Union, from the first in 1961 to the present, has been well below this deadly radiation field. Mercury, Gemini, Soyuz, Skylab, the Space Shuttle, all maintained altitudes well below 1,000 miles. All except Apollo. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt. And if we did, it wasn't a problem. We, if we were going to encounter it, then we would have had to build the spacecraft and the spacesuit to, uh, to, to not give humans a problem. You, you don't just build something and hope it works. You study to see what uh, the threats are, the environment is, and then you say, how thick do I have to make the metal on the spacecraft so that going through this kind of radiation or these kind of meteoroids, it won't get hurt. And so and then we build it that way. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above then the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt. But we didn't feel it inside, and we didn't get any you know, added radiation. In 1998, the space shuttle flew to an altitude of 350 miles, one of its highest altitudes ever, hundreds of miles below the beginning of a field of radiation that was so severe that the astronauts inside of their shielded spacecraft and inside of their shielded spacesuits saw flashes of light with their eyes shut that they described as shooting stars due to radiation penetrating first the shuttle's shielding, then their spacesuit shielding, then their skulls, and finally the retinas of their closed eyes. As a result, CNN issued the following report, noting NASA's unpredicted surprise. The radiation belt surrounding Earth may be more dangerous for spacewalking astronauts than previously believed. Scientists say the phenomena known as the Van Allen belts can spawn killer electrons when the Earth's magnetic field changes. These electrons that are being studied could have an important effect not only on satellites, which has happened in the past, but could also affect the astronauts by creating large doses of radiation that could influence their health. The electrons can penetrate through various materials, including spacesuits, and can pass through, in fact, the walls of the space station and can create high charges deep inside of these objects.
No strange uh, occurrences. Mm -mm, nothing like that. The uh, space fact, shuttle. Uh, go ahead. The space shuttle went to 365 miles a few years ago uh -huh. because I worked in news. Uh -huh. I saw CNN. They said that the radiation belts surrounding Earth are more dangerous than previously believed because the astronauts saw shooting stars with their eyes closed oh, just man, when they that got isn't within from 600. radiation belt. We saw shooting stars, but they're not shooting stars from with your eyes closed, although they look like it. Uh, if you're out in space beyond the Van Allen belt, and probably within the Van Allen belt, and close your eyes and just pay attention, you don't notice it unless you pay attention, then all of a sudden you'll see a little flash like a shooting star, except it's like that. There goes one this way. Then one just blossoms. And then not that fast. Maybe you wait three minutes or two minutes and one goes whoosh. And what's happening is cosmic rays are hitting the uh, back of your eye and exciting those sensors in the back of your eye. So that's what you see. And they got high enough apparently to close it. My guess is in Earth orbit, if you closed your eyes and just paid attention, that you would see them. The first time they were seen was when they went to 365 miles. Yes. That's 650 miles below or away from the radiation. Yeah, see, it, it's below. My guess if they just did it tonight. But see, if you're not, if you're just going to sleep or closing your eyes or it's dark, you don't notice them. But if you'll close your eyes and pay attention, which we had an experiment to do, by the way, then you see them whistling by. Not on our mission, by the way, they hadn't been discovered yet. I saw them one day on the moon. It wasn't dark, and it was kind of dark, and I saw this flash of light, and it looked like it was on the moon, but really it wasn't. It was a flash of light in my eye. Where were you when the Apollo 1 fire happened? Apollo 1 fire? I was uh, in my office at... Uh, the Johnson Space Center, it was about 6 in the evening, I was working late there at my desk. I got a phone call and uh, a voice on the other end said their name and I said, okay. They said, I knew who it was, it was the flight director or someone down at the Cape during the test and he said, we've lost the Apollo 1 crew. We think we've lost the Apollo 1 crew. I said, well, where are they? Have you ever uh, read the congressional report on that? Sure. They considered it at that point that it would be extremely difficult to go to the moon within two and a half years from that point. We did. We thought it would be. But so what, we, what big change happened to make it possible? Well, once again, uh, with what we knew at that time, it looked like that would be difficult. So, but we started out on the journey anyway. And as we started on the journey, we found ways to shorten it. For example, we had a lot more flights uh, planned prior to landing on the moon than we actually did. For example, testing the Saturn V. Uh, George Miller, one of the smart guys up there in headquarters, said, we're going to test, we've tested on the ground the S-4B and the S-1 and the S-2 sort of, we're going to put them all together and test them all at once because we've run out of time and we want to get to the moon by the end of the decade. And people thought that was a crazy idea. People said, no way, it's too many unknowns. We couldn't possibly do that. There's no way, and George Miller kept saying, if we want to get to the moon by the end of the decade, we're going to have to do this. And I can remember when that was proposed, I thought it was a real crazy idea, not very... A good idea. Looking back, it was a great idea. Now, Von Braun might have been in favor of it or he might not, but I'm sure if we asked him after it was all done, he would have said, what a great idea. We never thought of that when it began, and that compressed the, maybe the flight schedule by a whole year or maybe eight months or something like that. We did a lot of that. We, were, we had a goal to get to the moon by the end of the decade, and we were trying to do it. That doesn't mean we were being careless, but it meant we were doing everything we possibly could to make that, uh, that goal that President Kennedy set for us. And we did, in fact, make it. Now, you mentioned the guys who thought we didn't go to the moon. This must be what you're talking about? What? We, we found that. You've, I guess you're familiar with the Fox special. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. I watched it, yes. 
it's it's a good uh, it's 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 a money making thing. They don't have the landing legs extended. You know why? It won't it won't hold the lunar module up on Earth. But that's not uh, those landing legs aren't extended. But uh, you know this is just this is some you know guys stand around saying how can I make some money and make a movie? Well, I can make porno. That's good. I'm a filmmaker, and I've been in the business about 15 years, and I've been asked even to testify in court as to the authenticity of footage. And I saw this footage. It's dated by an atomic clock three days into the flight. All the astronauts are identified, and they're, we're, they're there putting the transparency over the window. They're clearly pretending to be halfway to the moon when they're not halfway to the moon. That is bullshit. I don't care what you say. I went to the moon and back, and everyone that's a scientist knows it. Now, if you want to not believe it, it's okay, you know? It's okay. It's a better story. It's ju it just happens to be a lie. That's all. Would you swear to the bi on the Bible that you walked on the moon? I'm not going to do it because I'll do it over here. I won't do it on your camera. Well, why not? Because it just isn't an appropriate thing to do. Well, but you're an asshole to do that. You're the same guys, just different guys that you did the other person I told you about. Well, would you put your hand on, if you walked on the moon, here's the opportunity to set the record straight. Okay. To put your okay. left hand on the Bible. Left hand. Raise your right hand. Okay. And you realize this can be used as a video deposition in the future. And if you lie, you'll be guilty of perjury. I understand that. Okay. Say your name. My name is Alan Bean. I swear to God and affirm. I swear to God and affirm. Under penalty of perjury. Under penalty of perjury? Treason? Treason? No, not treason. Treason has nothing to do with it. Let me rephrase this and say, I've got my hand on the Bible. I went to the moon. I walked on the moon. All the other people that you think are people that NASA says went to the moon and walked on the moon oh, you won't did went, go to the moon and walk on the moon. You won't say under penalty of treason. What's treason? That's, that's uh, doing something fraudulent to the taxpayers. That's crap. Well, what that about isn't under penalty of eternal damnation? Under penalty of inter eternal, eternal damnation, damnation. And under penalty of treason. Treason, to, treason is when you sell out your country. Well, if you used $135 billion to not go to the moon. That's still not treason. Treason is if you tell secrets to another thing. I have said enough. Now, you can use that and say, well, you didn't say something else. No. I know how people are. It's okay. Well, I've Take your stuff and get the fuck out. I've asked six other astronauts if they would swear on the Bible, and yeah. they refused to do it. Neil Armstrong refused to do it. He Michael just Collins said, I know. I know that. I know they do. Now, do you believe in God? Do I? Yeah. I'm pretty much. I wouldn't swear on the Bible if I didn't believe it. But it doesn't make any difference. You'll change it like you want. Take your stuff and go, guys. Why don't you? Well, I know for a fact you didn't walk on the moon. I've That's seen the fine. That's fine. It's okay if you know it. Do you understand that? <laughs> you can have any opinion you want. That's what's wonderful about this country. You can believe anything you want. And it's okay with me, for sure. Right. Get your stuff and go. Okay. Yeah, right here's fine. I'm Bart with ABC Digital. How are you doing? Um, I was given a classified tape from the Apollo program that's 31 years old. It's an unedited reel, including outtakes from the mission. Hmm. Uh, it's got about 20 takes of a single shot of the mission. What mission? Apollo 11. Yes. And the photography is being forged in the mission. They're faking a shot of being halfway to the moon. And they refer to you on the tape as a shot that was done during Apollo 10, where you put a transparency over the window and move the camera of the Earth and move the camera back away from the window, turn off the lights in the spacecraft, and appeared to be halfway to the moon when, in fact, they were in Earth orbit. Huh, really? Yeah, and they said it was the same way that you did it on Apollo 10. So we wanted to give you the opportunity to put your left hand on the Bible, to raise your right hand, to swear to God. Stick it in your ear. Well, you were giving an opportunity to swear to God under oath that you walked on the moon. I don't do that now. Well, if you really walked on the moon, what's the problem of swearing to God that you did? 
Do you believe in God? You want me to knock you in the head? Well, I want you to I want you to swear get to God on the Bible me. that you walked on the moon. Him, okay. If you walked on the moon, we're given the opportunity to swear to God that you walked on the moon. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get the hell knocked out of you if you don't leave me alone. I got to a point on uh, on my two flights to the moon, particularly my last flight where I actually lived, actually made the moon my home for over three days. You know, you, be, you, you become detached from one planet. You become detached from Earth, which is your identity with reality. But we launched at night at a circle of the Earth about uh, one and a half times and headed out to the moon for a three-day voyage when we got there. So the engine you, is loud? You get you get pardon is the engine loud as you're descending but it, well the engine is very loud it's very difficult to tell the difference between feeling sound and hearing sound but yes it's loud and when you were in it you couldn't hear it in the vacuum of space it's it's a very kinetic very dynamic period of about 10 to 12 minutes and you get down to 200 feet and you go through an area where you're either going to land or you're basically going to crash so is the earth i guess is six times bigger than Earth, the moon is from Earth. The, the, is Earth right? the Earth is about four times bigger than a full moon looks to us from Earth. It was very close to the horizon on Apollo 17, and that was unique for us. We didn't have to look up like most of the other flights from most of the other landing sites were to look at the Earth. I mean, I just glanced over my shoulder, and there's the Earth. It was there all the time. It was so prominent. It was almost involuntarily while you're going about your work and being a lunar geologist and exploring and driving a rover you'd always be confronted by the earth itself. It was, I tell you what, it was almost like a security blanket uh, because you knew it was there. Uh, it, 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 was the, it was the warmth that accompanied your visit to another planet. For instance, uh, our lunar module, when we lifted off the surface, had to burn for seven minutes and 14 seconds. Not just light off, only one engine. Uh, you know, we had redundant or backup valves, and, but only one engine, one set of propellant tanks. It had to light off and had to burn for 7 minutes and 14 seconds. If it quit earlier than 7 minutes and 7 seconds, we came back down to the moon. Uh, and there was no rescue. So there was no strange phenomenon going through the belts of any kind? No, nothing no, happened? No, there was no, 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 no great unknowns, no science fiction uh, going to the moon. It was all science fact, although sometimes it seemed like it was science fiction. I saw a CNN report about three years ago, the space shuttle went to about 365 miles, and that was the closest they got to the belts since the moon missions went through them. And they were about, I guess, <coughs> 650 miles away from the belts. And they reported that it was more dangerous than previously believed, and that when they were 650 miles away, inside a shielding better than you guys used, they could see the radiation with their eyes closed going through their skulls and the retinas of their closed eyes. Well, I, I don't know about the shuttle. The shuttle doesn't have the capability to go very far, uh, 400 miles. I don't know exactly where the <coughs> bell element. Quiet. Hey. 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 Quiet. You know, the shuttle doesn't have the capability to, to fly very far away from Earth. Uh, maybe three, four hundred miles. Uh, I don't know exactly how far out the radiation Van Allen belt is. It, it didn't seem to bother us very much. Did you see shooting stars? Uh, but uh, Did you see the shooting stars? Yeah, I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. But uh, uh, there's a lot of noise going on. It, so I, I, don't, I don't know the results of some of the experiments they've conducted. The point is they can't get that far from here and, and they're really in the protective confines of the Earth. Uh, outside the atmosphere, certainly. Now, on the way to the moon, we did conduct a lot. We didn't just, we weren't passengers away to the moon. We're passengers. We conducted all kinds of experiments, and, and one of them was an experiment where we closed our eyes and then we put some light sensitive pads on our eyes, and we could literally, yes, we could see, we could see traces of radiation or traces of something going through our eyes. We conducted this experiment both going to the moon and coming back from the moon several times. Now, what that all meant, I don't know, but it wasn't, the kind of, it wasn't the kind of radiation that gave us a problem of any kind. But you could see it. You could close your eyes and just, you could see these things shoot by. We all saw it. Not on our mission, by the way, they hadn't been discovered yet. We did it on more than one mission. 
I guess he knew Von Braun, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They found a publication of his that he did prior to the, <laughs> prior to the goal being set to go to the moon. And in it, he says, it is commonly believed that man will fly directly from the Earth to the moon. But to do this, we would require a vehicle of such gigantic proportions that it would prove an economic impossibility. Calculations have been carefully worked out on the type of vehicle we would need for the nonstop flight from the Earth to the moon and to return. The figures speak for themselves. Three rockets would be necessary. Each rocket ship would be taller than the Empire State Building, 1,250 feet, and weigh about 10 <sighs> times the tonnage of the Queen Mary, or some 800,000 tons. Now, the Saturn V rocket weighed 2,500 tons. Now, that's a difference of 32,000 percent. How do you explain that that change was made within a three-year period? All right, is this a Bible? Yep, absolutely. It's I my think Bible. this is ludicrous. And I want you to put that on film. It's ludicrous. I swear. Under penalty of perjury? I swear, swear under per penalty of perjury. Treason? And, treason. And eternal damnation. And eternal damnation. That and, I walked and on the moon death, during Apollo that, 17. That I walked on the moon on Apollo 17 for 75 hours. I lived on the moon for Apollo, on Apollo 17 for 75 hours. Well, six other astronauts did not swear in the Bible when they had the opportunity. Well, that's fine. I probably, you know why they didn't? The same reason I almost didn't, because it's absolutely ludicrous for you to ask me that. I, I, I probably would have done what the other six did, because I'm just as stubborn as anybody else. I said, I don't need to prove to you that I went to the moon. I know I went. But I did that. You can put that on tape, and it's there, and you can show it to anybody you want. You know what I do with the Hasselblad? He left it. It's sitting, it's sitting face up to the sun without a back on it so that somebody, somebody's going to go back and find out what kind of deterioration the lens suffered because it was facing straight up. Where is the lunar rover? It's a mile behind the... How do you think we took the pictures of the liftoff on Apollo 17 with a television camera? How do you think we missed them on Apollo 16 because of the time delay? By the time the guy sent the signal, it was gone and the camera couldn't track fast enough. So on 17, he sent the signal a second and a half or three quarters of a second earlier so that the camera got the signal and we were... How do you think that happened? I've got a book telling me I didn't go to the moon that, that thick, okay? There's a book there when all... You can't see stars in the daytime and the shadows in the wrong place. I don't give a... I don't give a damn about all that shit. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Mr. Collins, Bart Several, ABC Digital. How are you? Good. I'm the gentleman who found the uh, classified tape from your mission of you faking the window shot, putting the transparency over the window when you were supposedly halfway to the moon when in fact you were in Earth orbit. I have no idea what you're talking about. I think you must be some kind of wacko. Okay. Well. We have the opportunity to set the record straight. Well, We're asking you. you to. I'm not on the record right now. Would you, would, ask go, you to, would you please go away? Well, asking you to swear in the Bible that you orbited the moon. Would you please go away? Well, if you really orbited the moon, why won't you swear in the Bible that you did so? Can you tell me why you would have a problem doing that? Would you please go away? You don't remember the shot where you put the transparency over the window? We have it being done up to about 10 hours before they supposedly walked on the moon. I just don't understand why if you orbited the moon you wouldn't have a problem about swearing to the Bible on it. Can you tell me why? Are you afraid for the truth to come out? 
I think you're some kind of wacko. I really do. Well, I think it's wacky to not swear to God on something that's supposed to be obvious. Bart with ABC Digital. Um, we need to get back to that okay. signing. One quick question. We've All right. Very uh, I was given a classified. Okay. I was given a classified tape showing part of the Apollo mission being falsified, of lunar orbit being falsified. Being falsified. Correct. We've got an unedited tape from a source at That's the Johnson Space Center. Yes, totally right. nonsense. We want to give you the opportunity to swear in the Bible that you orbited the moon during oh, Apollo is, 15. Is, okay, thank you very much. Just one last note. If you orbit the moon, do you have a pro why do you have a problem swearing to God that you did so? Sir, I don't, but I don't feel like I have to do that. The data speaks for itself. Well, we have proof that the mission was falsified. No, you don't have to, sir. Well, we do. I, I appreciate it. I okay. appreciate it. Thank you, here. Thank you. All right. Howdy, Bart Several, ABC Digital. Uh, I was given a classified tape from Apollo 11 showing them taking the photography of lunar orbit. Why don't you quote me and say it's bullshit? Well, would you mind swearing on the Bible that you orbited the moon? If you really orbited the moon, why would you have a problem swearing to God that you did so? Mr. Anderson, can I take a picture with you real quick, sir? Oh, we are. No more, we're through. Okay, thank you, sir. I've got on the tape Neil Armstrong rigging part of the photography where he puts that. That'll tell you how screwed up. Thank you, Mr. Well, if you really walked on the moon, why do you have a problem? I mean, uh, orbited the moon, why do you have a problem swearing to God that you did so? Would you please just stay back? Howdy, Buzz. Who's that? How's it going? Remember me? What's your name? Bart. Bart Sibrel. Would you uh, give your name to my uh, oh, sister? Yeah, I got one for you, one for your lawyer to sue me. Yeah, That's right. Well, I hope you do. You you. I'd love to go to court and show yeah. them a window shot. I know you'd like to get a lot of attention, wouldn't you? Well, you're the one getting money for something you yeah. didn't do. You're getting a lecture <laughs> for walking on the moon when you didn't. Well, that's called being a thief. Why don't you just that's called being a thief. Do you think you can get to heaven without repenting? Why don't you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon? Please. Why don't you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon? I'm not trying to get you the tell him to get out of here? This is a hotel. We'll call right, we, the police. We solicit. pay. Doesn't Come on in not, here. We'll call the police. You like that? Why don't you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon? I, it doesn't, sir. I don't I have nothing to do with this. But okay. you cannot solicit on this property. We just paid right now, to rent out the penthouse to shoot up there. So. You can't solicit like this. On the keep, keep, keep shooting. All right. Well, then I'd go through my measures. Yeah. You got to keep shooting, man. Okay. Well, you can put it on your shoulder. Don't be shy. Come with me, bud. You really like it, don't you? You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of it. Saying Will I you misrepresented get it myself. Away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. Mr. Armstrong, Bart Several, ABC Digital. Wanted to give you the opportunity to swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Will you put your left hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked on the moon? Gentlemen. Mr. Cyberl. Yes? <clears throat> if you really walked on the moon, why would you not do that? So why don't you just put the end to the record in the argument and put your hand on the Bible, swear to God you walked on the moon. Mr. Cyberl, yeah. knowing you, that's probably a fake Bible. Really? Well, no, it's a real Bible. You have the opportunity to have $5,000. The meeting is not open. Well, you have $5,000 cash. You can give it to charity if you'd swear on the Bible that you Please. walked on the moon. Please I have a tape. It'd be fine. Why don't you I swear won't. to... Why not? Why won't you do it? So why don't you put your hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked yeah, on the moon? Mr. Cyberl has made a fool of himself in front of the world. Mr. Cyberl, you do not deserve answers. Tell us, what is this video? I'm not quite following it on right now.
Well, that looks like a Buzz Aldrin photograph there. <clears throat> I can't see it too clearly from my angle here. Is this a documentary about the moon missions? I believe so. Well, it's, I think it's a series of uh, <clears throat> a series of clips and vignettes. I'm not quite sure that's a documentary. Was this something from broadcast or something that? I'm sorry, I don't know. I'd, without looking at the label and looking at it more closely, I can. Do, I have a dozens of these things in here. What What is this? They're talking about shadows and stuff like that. What is that all about? You know, this might have come from. <clears throat> some of the challenges to the fact <clears throat> ah yes <clears throat> from the challenges by the group that has said we never went to the moon and they're trying to pick holes in some of the lunar photographs and it, <clears throat> it's an interesting subject because uh, they're totally misguided we did exactly what we said we did uh, and they can pick hole try to pick holes in the photography uh, all they want to but uh, Why is it that you have a copy of it? Big pardon? Oh, why do you have a copy of it? People send me stuff all the time. I, <clears throat> I have boxes and boxes of, of video from uh, various television programs, various uh, speeches that I've done. Uh, I must have three or four hundred of them. I don't, I, I look at very few of them. So someone sent you this? I'm sure that, well, they obviously did. That's why I have it. Oh, so it's not something that you acquired no. or ordered or anything no. like that? No. You have to understand, I get, I get a dozen, at least a dozen books a month to review, half, two or three, maybe four dozen uh, videos a year from various people just want me to have it, so they send it along. Hmm. We only brought like one clip. If you want to throw it in, okay, sure. pop that one out. Oh, that was stopping. Yeah, pick it again. Yeah, we can edit this that way. Well, you have to sit play. Well, it, it goes in. This is, what is this? Oh, this is a shot from 130,000 miles out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it's from approaching, the, it's from approaching the moon, looking back at the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen this on a couple of flights. Is, do, was this something that you got, although this is from Apollo 11, did you shoot a shot of the earth like this? Mm -hmm. So you had a, a TV camera in the spacecraft. That's correct. And this is, I guess, the Earth zoomed in at a distance. Yep, seems they to be. They get shot a little bit halfway to the moon. Mm -hmm. Now it's kind of, now I guess the cloud cover looks That's what you're looking right. at. Now what is that right there? What is what? There's like an arm, it looks like hair on an arm getting in front of the window. Now maybe somebody, maybe <laughs> somebody got their <clears throat> arm in front now of I it. Now I thought that was the arm of God <laughs> moving <laughs> right. across the Earth. I couldn't quite figure that out. I suspect out. that was the edge of the window, more than likely, that they were shooting at. What did the Earth look like from a great distance? There About it is like again, 130,000 miles out. About like that. So it was pretty small at the distance <coughs> of the moon? Yes, but I think the better images are the Hasselblad images that have been taken on every flight and are the most published pictures in the history of the world. What is that in the top left? If that's the Earth, is that like a, another spacecraft? No, oh, no, no, no. But I have no idea what that is. It's uh, some aberration on the film of some sort. Oh, those are shadows, I think. Or reflections, probably reflections that are just reflecting. Run that back line. again so we get another shot of it. If we you're going to press me on this, I'm not going to talk to you anymore because I won't pursue this. All of this attempt to say the Apollo programs were fake is just sheer nonsense. And you can talk till hell freezes over and you're wrong. Okay. Well, would you affirm? I won't continue well, on this line. Would you swear on the Bible? 
that you walked on the moon? You bet your sweet ass. Okay. Put your left hand on the Bible. Put your left hand on the Bible. Raise your right hand and say, I, Edgar Mitchell. I, Edgar Mitchell. Affirm. Affirm. Under penalty of eternal damnation. I don't believe in that, but under, if you penalty think, of eternal damnation. That I walked on the moon on Apollo 14. That I walked on the moon on Apollo 14. Well, you know, you're the first astronaut to do that. We asked six other astronauts to swear on the Bible, and they refused to do it. Well, <laughs> I don't particularly like to take oaths like that either, because I don't accept the Bible as a gospel of anything except a historical record. But we did go to the moon. You bet your sweet ass we went to the moon. Okay, turn off the camera. Your interview is done. I've given you all the time I'm going to give you. Okie dokie. Good to meet you. I don't say it's a pleasure. I understand. Please get your ass out of my house. Okay. And you came here under false pretenses, and I think you're an asshole. Well, and if you continue this, and if you press us, I will personally take you to court. I, I hope that you do. I invite you to. I'm going to give you my card so you can arrange that. And I'm encouraging I, you to you're arrange. Fran you're frankly not worth it. No, no. I, I, we have you on the record saying you'll take me to court. I hope you do. Because we have proof that would prove it in a court of law that Apollo 11 didn't go to the moon. <laughs> and I think it's something that you should see. It. I don't say that lightly, believe me. I don't say it lightly. You, you have joking, and sir. People can have fun. And maybe do that if they feel like they want to have a little fun on a trip to the moon. As an independent producer. Okay, we're heading out. Doing that is against moral ethics. Lying about going to the moon is a satanic lie hey, of gigantic proportions. I don't hit people, but you're going to be on the deck unless you get well, I'm the heading out. I appreciate it. And get the hell out of the black house. Do you get a gun and shoot them at them before they get out of the office? <laughs> <laughs> we have a video camera running if you want to do it. Right. I, I, that would be great footage for us. See you later. In court, I hope.
relaxing. I was gonna say like why not CNN or but what who cares? White Shoes right is about a future movie or something coming out or No. Okay. It's not about any movie, it's not about the movies I've made in the past. It's a confession of sorts. Okay. I mean about you cheated on your wife, you no. plagiarized I would never do that. No. Plagiarized something. It's about a movie I made that nobody is aware of even though they've seen it. Okay. Is that intriguing? Do I have you intrigued? Well, I mean, see if I understand what you said. It's about a movie you made, no one knows you made. Is that what you said? That's right. It's a production. Like, I, I, some of you put, like, uh, you didn't put your name on it? Like, at the end, you put, like, a fake name? Oh, no. I I made it. Like Alan Smithy, like that That's sort right. Of thing? No, I didn't. There was no name put on it. Why? Why would there be no credits? What do you mean? Because there are some things that you just can't. Put your name on. Okay. Okay. I perpetrated a huge fraud, which I am now about to detail. Okay. Involving the United States government and NASA. All right. And I'm sure you've heard the rumors. The moon. The moon landing. Hope? That's right. That the moon landing was fake. The, the moon landing, moon landings, all were fake, and I was the person who filmed it. You're serious, and okay. I'm serious. You're, I'm dead serious. Because I only have this certain amount of time with you, and I and I'll talk about whatever you want. You know, this isn't uh, some type of joke or no, it's not film a, within a film thing. Not a joke. Nope. Okay. The uh, conspiracy theorists were right on this on this occasion. Why? I don't know about Paul McCartney's death, but this they were right about. Okay, why in God's name? Would, I don't know what to ask you first. Well, why the hell? If you're telling the truth, why would you do it? Why are you telling me? I mean, what? The? Don't you think it's important for people to know the truth? Yeah, I got yes, yeah, certainly. They had a, a, a massive fraud, a, an unparalleled fraud perpetrated against them. They should know. Okay. Um, I mean, they're already suspicious of the government. They may as well have their suspicions confirmed. Okay. Um, justified. And this, why now? I mean, we're almost 30 year anniversary. Uh, what? What took so long? Why are you? Why? Why? If this is true, why? Well, going to that, it has to do with personal. Okay. Uh, uh, evolution and influences. And, well, I'll go into that. Is that why you look a little haggard right now? Because you look a little worn. No offense. Like, well, also, yeah, because I haven't been taking care of myself too well. I've been drinking a lot, but is that because of the stress of this? Of is course, that... stress, guilt, just conflict of all kinds. <sighs> Wow, I mean, so you, you, you feel bad about this, clearly. I mean, this is... Nice. I do feel bad about it. I also feel proud of it. It's a terrible conflict. Because you've pulled off one of the greatest hoaxes ever because of and your... And because I made a film, if you want to call it a film, which I consider to be my masterpiece. And you can't take credit or even talk about it as a... As well, a I'm, here well, by, you are now. I'm hereby taking credit. Right, but you can't actually go out. You're doing it. when people see this, no it'll be you'll be dead until ten years. Right, 15 or fifteen. Years yeah. After my death. So you can't talk to Roger Ebert about 
it, you know, does that frustrate you? I have to pay the consequences for the decision that I made many years ago to go along with this. Like a deal with the devil. It's Faustian, to be sure. Because, and is that why you got such power in Hollywood? I mean, that would explain that. Why I have the freedom I have, that was part of it, yes. So they, they, they said, do this moon thing and we'll when give I, you... When I made Spartacus, I didn't have this kind of freedom. Right. But I have it now. So what came and first, the NASA, genius or the what fraud? NASA's doing? Well, what came first, the genius or the fraud? I mean, did the fraud enable the genius or was the genius released well, like the fraud? I think the genius came first. Right. But some frauds are hard to bypass, especially if you have an ego and you're an artist and you, you're presented with a challenge, the likes of which you've never seen and will probably never see again. You don't even think of the morality of it. You're just completely swept, swept away by the flattery of it and the juices inside you, which make you want to do it as the, the artist you are innately. You don't think of anything else. What a conflict. I mean, gosh, I can't imagine being presented with that opportunity. On one hand, I really would want to do it, but then I'd probably say, well, I'm committing a crime and lying. And It must... depends, but my guess would be, no, you, you, if you're good, you would do it. I, I discussed this with... Levinson, Barry Levinson. Right. I discussed it with. Oh, he made Wag the Dog, right? Yeah. Yes. Spielberg, of all people, believe it or not. Yes. So, wait, Wag Scorsese, the Dog. Oh, Coppola, yeah. Scorsese, even Woody Allen, I discussed. There isn't one of them who wouldn't do this. Right. And did that. So, Barry Levinson must have been influenced by this whole. He must have known. So, that's Wag the Dog is about this whole idea. Oh, I mean, that's why the Stan character was named Stanley. Right. And he gets killed at the end because he demands he credit. Killed at the so tell me about the making of it. So, was it difficult? I mean, <laughs> committing the greatest fraud, uh, what you want to call it. I'm not saying I it's a... Okay, I'm a not, lot about that. At the I know. So, I'm not making a moral judgment, but making this huge, ambitious, technical foe landing, was it part of the 2001? Was it very difficult? I mean, what was the experience like? Artistically, practically, emotionally, what was Nothing it like? Nothing was for? harder than 2001. So the, 2001 was harder than faking the moon landing. It actually was. Because you learned things on 2001 and... Yes. I mean, it's, 2001 was very ambitious. And that's not to say that faking the moon landing was not ambitious. But, uh, yeah, I learned things making 2001, which is why I got this gig in the first place. Right? Right. Right. That makes sense. So, so what was the... But it, was, it was easy for me because... Um, well, first of all, I didn't think a whole lot about the morality of it, as I said. If I had, I might have been uh, more uh, hesitant, more stifled in my work, but I didn't. And I, I could see that, that Neil was, actually. He was bothered by it. More than Buzz Aldrin or anyone else involved? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. About in what? a way, everything was going to center around him. He was the one who was supposed to come down off the ladder and announce the, the step for mankind and what have you. Uh, he sensed that this was going to be a life-changing experience for him. And I mean on a major scale. Uh, actually, he was, uh, he was rather tortured by it the rest of his life. Really? I mean, is that why you think of interviews? Yes, and, and, that's, and, and, and in, in fact, uh, that actually began to affect my own perception of it, watching what what happened to him. Okay, in what way? Just seeing the deterioration of him? And, I mean, was he depressed? or? He was depressed. He was uh, drinking heavily, um, bitter, scared. Uh, just phobic, uh, avoiding people. Uh, and that guy Bart Sibrell or something tried to get him to swear in a Bible. I mean, I mean, what, when I say he affected me, that's why there was so much time in between films for me. Between uh, uh, 
Full Metal, yeah, Full Metal Jacket, and well, between uh, uh, The Shining and Full Metal Jacket was about six years. Between Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut is 13 years. Yeah. And a lot of that time was spent just like just emotionally processing. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it became very conflicting for me. I was proud of my work, but at the same time. And this was a lot, to, a lot because of Neil's influence. Not consciously, he didn't do this to me consciously, but I spent a lot of time with him and each time I did, I became more and more bothered, troubled by my own participation in this. Okay. Well, what would he say? I mean, what, what was, did he explain the source of his depression? I he mean, was what? on the verge of tears. He did not cry, I won't say he cried, but he was on the verge of tears so many times because of what he did. I mean, what he participated in. It's almost as if he thought up the idea, you know? Right. He felt that guilt. He was almost used, really. Okay. But he's the one who felt the guilt. I'm sure NASA did not feel that much guilt. And, I mean, why did he go up, I wonder? I wonder why. Because they promised him a seat connect in three years when they figured it out. They kept lying about it being possible. So why do you think he did it? Why did Armstrong do it in the first place? He, he thought, they kept saying, we'll be ready in three years and you'll go then. Just lie now and we'll go in three years. The funding will keep going and we'll we'll figure this out and you'll go. Oh, actually. Right, yeah. And you say, but they were lying, you know, and, that, and they figured it out. And he got really, you know, so cynical. Got it? So, uh, so why did Armstrong go? I mean, he was such a moral principled man. If he, why would he go on a fake moon mission? I don't believe that. Well, they strung him along because they led him to believe, oh, don't worry, we're going to have the money in a few years and we'll actually go and then you will go. They'll have, of course. you mean they'll have the technology in a few years? Yes. Okay. They will have enough, they will, yes, they will be able to uh, actually perform the miracle of going to the moon. And yes, he would be in the saddle. So otherwise, okay, let's make this clear. Kennedy set a deadline, psychological deadline of the 60s. They knew they couldn't beat it. Right. So they, they could have beat they, they did. Right, and if they did, you're saying they sincerely thought that they would really get there within a few years. I believe, yes, they did think so. Because that's what they, well, I mean, that's... Although some didn't. There was a, a difference of opinion. There were some that just believed honestly that we will never be able to get there. There's just no chance. That Werner and I used to like have coffee in the mornings, and he was like, that, you know, there, uh, "There's no fucking way." Like, you know, is it right? like you know, even Werner von Braun. So go, you got that. Some people didn't believe that you could go. Even, well, or? Werner von Braun, of course, did. The, the director didn't think so. The man was just too brilliant. He knew that we couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Are you? So, okay, I'm talking about a guy working for, on two lost causes, the Nazism and, 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 and you know, the, the, the quest for the moon. I mean, he really, did, and he didn't tell them? I mean, did he ever tell them? Did he tell NASA? Like, did he tell the president we can't go? I mean, I mean, he must have, he must have been broke the news. Well, he was very old, of course, at the time. And a lot of people just dismissed him. Younger, more ambitious people. Some of them really thought we could get there. Right. Or wanted to believe it. Maybe on a conscious level they knew we couldn't, but they just wanted to believe the impossible because they were so full of themselves. And so full of the dream. Yes. The dream the dream was very powerful. And that's what beguiled Armstrong. Here the noble stand up guy and he didn't want to be part of the lie, but he he knew he'd get a seat if he played ball on when when they actually did go up. He was too good but, for this. But that day never came, obviously. That day never came. And what did that do to him? I mean, it gradually destroyed him, I think. Okay. He deteriorated. Um, yeah, like I said, he, he he drank a lot. He was full of self-recrimination, and so was I. Well, mainly from his influence. I, I almost it's like I I caught it okay. from him. And I'll tell a story about, uh, I talked to him one last time before his death, and he made me promise to get this news out. It was too great. It was, you know, this one last story. I, I died before his death. Okay. One last conversation that, it, that, that uh, right, the last conversation you had was about three months ago. And he said that, 
you know, uh, whether, you know, that he, he, he record, like, he's going to write a letter and, and put it in a drawer and maybe his wife someday will give it out. But he's like, or it's like, you, you know, you're a media guy. You got to tell the truth one day, you know, right before, but he urged me to tell the truth. You know, he, you know, he couldn't because of reasons that, he, that because he was a government employee his whole life and he had a government pension. And here I am a millionaire. Like, you know, you, you can afford to Stanley tell the truth. You know, I still get a government pension, you know, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's been eating on you to do this. And that's why you're not doing it now. You're doing it 15 years from now you know, or whenever. Like, in other words, you're telling this. That's why you're not announcing on CNN. It's because you're going to honor his wish. But you're not ready for it now to come out. But this is, you're doing this why for now. Why am I putting it up? Because I think I'll... Be because you don't want your family... You, you want to be dead. Right, right, right. And you don't want your family to have 15 years on it. Your wife will probably be dead and your kid will be grown. Right. You want distance from your legacy from this truth. That's it. Okay. okay. Right, right. So, what happened? Um, so, so, so what? So, so, what really motivated contacting me as a filmmaker was I talked to Neil, and I was I really felt guilty, and that's why I arranged for you to interview me because I wanted to blah blah blah. blah. Let's talk about the motive. So, so wait, so, so Neil really got to you. I mean, it sounds like he's the impetus of this entire confession in a way. I mean. It, it's your. It's like a theme. Like so, he really it made you become me. circumspect uh, about this. He even virtually begged me to um, reveal all this. He couldn't do it himself. He he has a pension to worry about. Uh, I had basically nothing to lose. I'm you know an established filmmaker, not involved with the government in any way except for this one job. And I, I made my my millions. I'm I'm really basically set for life. I'm almost seventy. But you still must fear one thing they can do to you, which is, I mean, I don't know. Do you ever? I mean, you, they are, you obviously do you ever worry about them killing you because of the secret? I mean, you have become a bit of a recluse. I don't know. The, you know, with the yeah, um, Garbo, Howard Hughes, J.D. Salinger, and me. Right. And to some degree, Neil. But did they? I mean, did any of them think that? The government was out to get them, and I'm not saying you think that, but do you? I mean, the government obviously no. said they'll kill you. I mean, obviously, the government said we'll kill you if, if you say anything. I mean, that, that's a standard top secret sort of penalty. It's thing. understood, even if it's not said. Right, but they did say it to you, I presume. Yeah, they they, they did. I mean, the, yes, the government they, 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 they said basically. So they it was. Tried to be cute about it, but yeah, it was said. In no uncertain terms. So why are you? So this won't this can't this get you killed? Well, that's why I'm uh, delaying it. Okay, the fifteen years this thing. It's not going to be seen. Okay, until for another fifteen years 15 after your death. Well, no, that's if you die tomorrow. You're not going to die tomorrow, clearly. I'm sorry. Okay, try again. Try again. Yeah, it's okay. This, so why you could get killed by doing this? This could kill you. Why are you doing that? That's. Well, this is not going to be seen until oh, of our 15, 15 years after my So death. now I, that's why I have you sign the NDA and all these, okay. That's right. All right. Well, that makes sense now. Okay. I understand that now. All right. It should be known, but I want there to be some kind of cushion for my family. Uh, 15 years seems like a good, you know, Okay. All right. After my death, 15 years after my death. But, okay. So let's take a step back. You're making this tape out of an effect Neil had on you? I mean, Armstrong sort of influenced you? much. Um, sometimes it just takes a catalyst. I mean, you know, somewhere inside you, you know what's right. Right. I mean, I, I went for years just thinking I was doing the right thing, just, just through my art. You know, and then something comes along that uh, you don't even recognize as a temptation because you're so swept away by your own ego. Uh, it took someone like... Neil Armstrong and distance and time to hammer into me what this really meant about society, about myself, about the human condition, even which is what I'm about. Uh, so you must feel yes. very proud and very, very, very guilty and proud of this thing. I mean, yes, conflicted. I mean, I still think it's. A terrible, maybe it's a terrible thing to say, maybe not, but I look at that or even think of it, I just remember it, and I think this was my fucking masterpiece. Yeah. I still think so. Right, I mean, 
It's the greatest. And it's flaws. <laughs> it's my goddamn masterpiece. It's better than 2001. It's better than Passive Glory or or uh, Clockwork Orange or Barry Lyndon or Doctor Strange Love. And, and, All of which I love, but and, and, and you're inclu- now that that's the moon landing itself, and that's, and what a triumphal story that is. Uh, were you involved in any of the other missions at all, or is that just the one? I mean, would they just take your thing, or did it was it a one off, or did you get did you do them all? I mean, you just did eleven and thirteen. They brought you back after twelve failed. Okay, right. just to just to do thirteen. That's it. Um, and Neil helped you with that. So so was it just a one off? I mean, you just did. Did you do them all? Well, I did eleven and thirteen as well. You did thirteen. Uh, okay. Not twelve. Why did why is thirteen a failure then? Why did you? Well, they brought me back. And why? But why did you make it? Twelve failed. You uh, twelve failed. How? You what do you mean? How did twelve fail? Tell me, twelve failed. How did it? I'm I'm asking you a character. How did twelve fail? Sam, can we stop? Nobody watched it. No one cared. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so you did eleven and thirteen. But why? Why thirteen? Why did you make thirteen and do like a failure? Why did you? 